Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Our Lady of the Rosary Cathedral Facebook. Today, I have two questions for you. And the, it's a question is very simple. And the question is also the title of our program today. Is God calling you? How do I respond? These two questions will be answered in this transmission today. And but before we do that, I would like to take this moment to uh, introduce myself and others who are with me today. My name is Father Duong Nguyen. I am the pastor of Our Lady of the Rosary Cathedral. And I'm also a member of the Society of the Divine Word. Today I have with me a religious sister and I also have with me a religious priest. Both of them are missionaries. Both of them are following the calling in which God has called us. Today, our community has celebrated already in the morning, Good Shepherd Sunday. And the image that we have of the Good Shepherd is one who loves us, who cares for us, who protects us, who walks with us, but at the same time, the image of a good shepherd also is calling us also. When God call, how do we respond? So in our program today, I would like now to present, ask uh, Sister Abrilia Untato, a Holy Spirit sister, to introduce herself to us. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Sister Aprilia Untarto. I'm the vocation director of the Holy Spirit Missionary Sisters. Originally, I'm from Indonesia, so I came to the United States uh, 13 years ago. Thank you. Also, we have with me one of my confrere, who is also a member of the Society of Divine Word, Father Adam McDonald. I would like to invite Father Adam McDowell to please introduce yourself. Thank you, Father Duong, for inviting us today. Yes, my name is Father Adam McDonald. I am a Divine Word missionary priest, originally from Flint, Michigan, and have been in religious vows now for 25 years and soon to be 20 years as a priest. I've served in Japan, 
in the Philippine Islands, and for the last nine years have had the privilege of serving on our Divine Word Vocation Team based here at our college seminary in Iowa. So a very good afternoon to all who are watching. Thank you everyone for being here. So I would like to take this moment to welcome everyone who are watching us right now. Today is not only Good Shepherd Sunday, but it's also a day, a world day of prayer for vocations. Our vocationals, recruiters who are present here, will be sharing their, uh, their story with us. And they will go be helping us, accompanying us to see if we have the call, what do we need to do? But to begin, we will be, to begin our conversation, uh, let us begin with a little prayer. We take ourselves, put ourselves in the presence of God, knowing that God is with us, watching us, caring for us as a good shepherd. And God is calling each one of us so that we may have the grace to consider the call. I invite all you to pray along with me this prayer, the grace to consider the call. Lord Jesus, just as you called the first disciples to make them fishers of men, so may you continue to make your sweet call heard today. Come follow me. Give young men and women the grace to respond readily to your voice. Sustain our bishops, priests, and consecrated people in their apostolic labor. Let our seminarians persevere along with all who are achieving the ideal of life, totally devoted to your service. Reawaken in our communities the missionary commitment. Lord, send laborers into your harvest and do not let mankind go astray because there are not enough pastors, missionaries, and other vow to the cause of the gospel. Mary, mother of the church, model of every vocation, help us to answer yes to the Lord who calls us to collaborate in the divine plan of salvation. Amen. Thank you for praying along with us. Now, today is a World Day of Prayer for Vocation, so we want to pray prayers that lead us to promote more vocation. But to continue to our topic or, or to begin our topic, is God calling you? How do I respond? Many of you know that the scripture are full of story of God calling each one of us. There's one particular story that I would like to read for you and share with you today. Now this calling is the calling of Samuel. It is taken from the first book of Samuel, chapter three, verses one through 10. I invite you to listen to the words of God. During the time young Samuel was ministered to the Lord under Eli, the word of the Lord was scarce and vision infrequent. One day, Eli was asleep in his usual place. His eyes had lately grown so weak that he could not see. The Lamb of God was not yet extinguished. Yet Samuel was sleeping in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. The Lord called to Samuel, who answered, Here I am. He ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You call me. I did not call you, Eli answered. Go back to sleep. So he went back to sleep. Again, the Lord called Samuel, who rose and went to Eli. Here I am, he said. 
you call me? But he answered, I did not call you, my son. Go back to sleep. Samuel did not yet recognize the Lord, since the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again for the third time. Getting up and going to Eli, he said, Here I am, you call me. Then Eli understood that the Lord was calling the youth. So he said to Samuel, Go to sleep. And if you are called, reply, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. When Samuel went to sleep in his place, the Lord came and stood there, calling out as before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant is listening. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, this is a good story. I like the story. One of the reasons I like the story is that because God called, and sometimes we do not recognize how God is calling us. And God is calling us so many different ways, especially even to Samuel, who is so close to God, near the Ark of the Covenant, yet even so close to God, God speaks, and sometimes we do not recognize how God is speaking to us. If we do not recognize speaking to us, sometimes we do not know how to respond. But if we do know how to respond, we can certainly say, yes, here I am, Lord, speak, for your servant is listening. Today, let me begin with uh, a few questions to help our vocation, our vocational director to respond to some of their story, their personal story, the story of how God has called them and how they have responded to that calling. So I will be asking both Sister Aprilia and also Father Al, uh, Adam McNall to share your vocational story. So my question for you is this, how are you called to follow Christ? and to live a life as religious missionary. Were there anyone in your life that helped you to discover God's calling? Maybe we can begin the story, the sharing with Sister Aprilia. Okay, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, actually, my uh, vocation story started when I was a little girl, when I was about four or five years old. Uh, even though at that time I wasn't baptized yet, uh, I had to go with my family to the church every Sunday. And in this particular church, there was a sister who always gave the announcement at the end of the mass. And I didn't know why, but I was excited always to see her. And since then, I like to picture myself uh, in the habit so yeah and and i've been thinking about it and actually it was a privilege for me to be able to attend catholic school from kindergarten to high school so i'm exposed more uh, to the religious life uh, so i had a better chance also to be exposed and to know more about uh, sisterhood in in my school stay so since then, uh, actually maybe fourth grade, I started to say that I really want to be a sister. One day I want to be a sister. So of course that the desire uh, uh, for me to be a sister and also to get married uh, were in my head, you know, and I like to spend my time surfing in the Paris. I joined the charismatic movement at least for maybe 13, 14 years and involved in some ministries like praise and worship, visiting the sick. I was also uh, uh, involved a lot uh, with, the, uh, with the Taisei and I became a good friend of one of the Jesuit priests in my parish. And I like to share my desire to be a sister to him. So, and at the time uh, to get married was also in my mind and I was amazed to see how my mom took care of us, my father and my siblings, uh, we are three in the family. 
so actually, uh, when I was about 30, uh, I decided to make a discernment. So I had uh, two years of discernment. Uh, which vocation I would like to pursue. So my spiritual director said that I would be curious for the whole life if I didn't try. So at the age of 33, I thought that it was not bad at all, you know, to try. So then I decided to say yes to this call and choose radically to follow my gut along this path. So yeah, uh, that's, that's my brief <laughs> vocation story, Father. Thank you. Certainly, God sent or give us a gift, the grace to wake up in us the desire. Mm -hmm. And it's being fostered within your families and mm -hmm. many other people who are in your life to help you to grow and to nurture that vocation to such a point that you have already become a sister for a good number of years already. And you have joined the, the Holy Spirit congregation uh, so I have a video already to show the world, to show other people, yeah. your community, and what are the, the charism that they are doing right now. I ask you to look at this video, okay? This video does not have voice layover. It has only a few words, but sometimes image speak to us about what we are doing, what the charism is about, how they share God's love, how they share the words of God, and how the Holy Spirit sister which Sister Aprilia Untato belong, we carry out that words of God into the world today. So we will now see this video made by the Holy Spirit Sister. And uh, this video will help us to get a glimpse of what is going on in the world of the Holy Spirit. So I ask you to, to slowly now, just kind of look the picture. There's a few message in there but you have to read it carefully now. If you do not read it carefully, you do not know how God want to uh, how God want her to come in your life. Because the uh, sister to her vocational talk, yeah, she allowed God to speak to her. She allowed God to come to her life. And so now we will see this video made by the Holy Spirit sister.
sister, if you notice the music, the background of the music is what child is this? And the song speak about God being a small child already living already in this world, incarnate into the very life of the world. And the sister are doing so many of those bringing God into that world today. Now, can you share with us a little bit about like this, that video kind of give us a glimpse about the mission of the works of the Holy Spirit sister. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe have share with us what's the charism of our society and the work that you are doing so that people know exactly what is the what does the charis charism of the Holy Spirit sister? Uh, yeah, actually, oh, we are missionaries, uh, like a divine word of uh, divine word missionaries, and we are in 50 countries around the world, means that we work with the people. So we work uh, to answer the needs of the people. We do not just uh, work as a teacher or as a nurse, but we go there and we see what is the need of the people. So there are a varieties of work of ministry that we can we can do uh, uh, as a Holy Spirit missionary sister. If you uh, remember the last picture, uh, two uh, yeah, two one sister and one lay. Actually, it was uh, it is in our. Life Learning, Holy Spirit Life Learning Center in Chicago, where I started this ministry uh, in 2012. So this, uh, this ministry serve uh, the population, especially to the immigrants, to the immigrants, uh, Mexican immigrants, uh, Spanish speaking uh, uh, women. And also after a while, we also include their husbands in and also their children. So we serve, we give basic uh, uh, skill like sewing, uh, like uh, art and craft. Also, we give English for second. So this is just one of the many ministries that we are doing. Thank you, sister. So you get a chance to see how the charism of her society is being brought out into the world. The gift that was given, now the gift that is being shared with others yeah. in our life. Yeah. Now, let us now kind of focus on uh, another vocation story. And this vocation story is Father Adam McDonald. Let me repeat it, the question again so that uh, our audience who happen to be tuning in or not tuning in, they might be able to recall what are you trying to answer here? So my question for you is that, how did God call you? Now, how did you respond and try to live out that calling? Were there anyone in your life that helped you to discover God's calling in your life, Father Adam McDonald? Thank you so much for the questions and for the invitation again to host us uh, this afternoon. Such an appropriate day to have this conversation on World Day of Prayer for Vocations, Good Shepherd Sunday, Fourth Sunday of Easter. I don't have quite as beautiful a video or sound as the Holy Spirit sisters do, but I'd like to begin to answer your question by showing you a brief two minute video that I actually prepared a couple of years ago. But as I was preparing for this conversation, I listened to the first part and it seemed to speak exactly to where we are today, especially as we have this conversation, realizing that very close to us and all around the world, the way we are living and the way we are aware of our being one human family is so affected by the reality of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I will try to share my screen with you so you can watch this video with me. What gives me the greatest joy in living out my vocation as a religious priest and missionary is that of being a witness to the presence and the activity of God in the lives of the people I serve on a daily basis. I often tell people that as a priest, the most important thing I do is not necessarily the mass I celebrate each morning, the homily I preach, the people I may anoint during the day, or the children I may baptize on any given Sunday, but it's the questions I have the chance to ask. Did you recognize God's presence in that moment of your life? Were you aware that God's grace was available to you in that experience or in that relationship? There's so much darkness, there's so much pain in our world that it truly is a source of joy and it's a great privilege 
to be a bearer of the light of Christ and a reminder to others that that light of Christ lives in their hearts and that together we are called to let our light shine and to be light for our world. Those who inspire me in my vocation most certainly include my parents. My late mother, Roseanne, once discerned her own call to be a religious sister before discerning the call to marriage. She, together with my father, Lawrence, was always very active in our faith community as I was growing up. And it was the fact that my parents didn't so much talk about their faith, but truly lived it and strived to put it into practice that made a great impression on me and my siblings. An impression that as Catholics, as Christians, and as children of God, we're not called just to live for ourselves alone, but to use the gifts and talents God has given us to serve the needs of those around us. Another person who inspires me greatly to live my vocation is a priest of the Diocese of Lansing, Michigan, by the name of Father Matthew Fidoa. Father Fidoa was the pastor of my parish for many years as I was growing up, and it was observing Father's generosity, his kindness, and his dedication, and the simple way in which he gave witness to the goodness and the kindness of God, which inspired me to want to do the same. Thank you, Father Adam, for that wonderful video. Certainly, there are many people who help you to discover your own calling, or they Indeed. help you to discover the discernment of God. You Indeed. also mentioned that we are living in a very, very special time now. Yes. Even though we are living in a special time, even though we are in living in a pandemic moment, a moment in which there are fears and concern, in a time in which we are locked down, or we have a stay at home order, we go outside, we have to wear a mask to make sure that we don't get infected. Now in time like this, in time of pandemic, does God still call young men and women today? Now, if God is calling us, like the, he called Samuel way, way back then, he called both of you and the, the, your religious congregation who have called different people at different times, at different places. And now we have to focus on the young people as well, young men and young women who are listening to us right now, who know that God may be calling them. Now, one of the question I raise is then, how do young people know that God is calling them to this way of life? And what visible qualities or sign that are present to help them to discover, yeah, God is speaking to them. Perhaps I could begin to address this question and Sister Aprilia uh, would like to add something. Uh, I would say that in answer to your first question, that this is definitely a time where God is not only continuing to call, but because of the increased silence and the slower pace in which many of us are living, we may actually be better able to hear and take the time to discern the call. It's also the fact that we are ever more aware in this moment and in these months and weeks that the needs of the world are so great and that we're not in this alone. And I don't just mean to say we're not in the pandemic alone, we're not in life alone. I think of what I said in the video about the realization I had that I was not called to live just for myself. This time of pandemic is a very powerful time to recognize that there are people around us who need the gifts and talents we have and the interests and passions and desires we have to make a difference in the world. And we recognize with so many being sick and having lost their loved ones, just how precious this one life that we have is. And so I would say, and I think Sister Aprilia would agree, this is a wonderful time to consider how we want to offer this one precious life to make a difference in our world. I think uh, when I was a young person, I wish I would have had this question myself, uh, just to share briefly a little bit more of my own story in terms of when I was the age of our listeners now. I was a sophomore, second year high school student, 15 years old, growing up in Flint, Michigan, one of six kids in a large Catholic family, but unfortunately did not have the chance to go to Catholic school. So my only religious education came through listening to my parents talk about the faith praying before meals, being forced whether I wanted to go to church or not, and also having to go to a religious education program. Sometimes I went, 
Sometimes I was there physically and mentally, I was somewhere else. But it was during that sophomore year of high school at the age of 15, I had the opportunity to participate in the washing of the feet on Holy Thursday, which we've just celebrated now a few weeks ago during Holy Week again. And I was representing the young people of the parish portraying one of the 12 apostles. And when Father washed my feet, it was the first time in my life I remember experiencing very personally and powerfully a sense of God's love for me. The fact that God even knew I existed out of all the billions of people in the world and that God knew me as I am with everything I've done and everything I failed to do and that God still washed my feet just as Jesus washed the feet of Judas who would betray him and Peter who would deny him. He didn't pick and choose. And it was from that very moment that I got the insight that my life was not mine alone, that it was given to me by God, and that I was called to go and wash the feet of and serve the needs of others. So for young people uh, like myself, I would say uh, some ways to recognize the call are kind of what happened to me in the months that followed that foot washing experience. I wanted to get involved in knowing more about who was this Jesus. I'd heard a lot about him, I really did not know and had not paid very close attention. So I began to really perk up and listen and ask questions and read scripture and read about the faith. This was before Google, so I had to kind of do it old school and actually pull some books off the shelf and, and read books. I became an altar server for the first time as a 16-year-old high school student. Most altar servers are retiring at that time. I joined the parish youth group. I became a Eucharistic minister. My first part-time job was working in the parish office in the evening as a receptionist. So I went from no interest in my faith to all of a sudden being immersed in the life of my faith and being around people, father, sister, very actively people in the church who had close and deep personal relationships with God. And it was by associating with them and being around them and getting my feet wet, so to speak, by trying out different ways of being a service that I discovered I liked who I was and whom I was becoming in this process. It felt better to be me when I was around people who were about serving others. And so I began to recognize this as a call that because I enjoy serving, because I enjoy helping, because I'm a good listener, I think I mentioned them in the video as well, that listening is a very important one, part of what I do as a religious missionary priest that all of these were kind of signs to me that maybe God might be calling me. I think Sister Aprilia had a few thoughts that she wanted to add on that question as well. Uh, maybe I will just add uh, one or two. Uh, for me, uh, if you develop a curiosity about religious life and if uh, the possibility to be religious or to be priest uh, keeps coming back to your mind, and, and, and then the last one, I think there is such an inner peace and joy inside of you when you think and pray about this possibility. Yeah, I think that's, that's from me, yeah. Thank you for helping some of our young people to discover that God reaches us in different ways, but if we follow the call by living a life of service, we will certainly discover who we are. We will certainly find peace within our hearts. At the same time, we grow in, the, in that process with other people around, around all of us. So my next question for both of you is this, what are some of the obstacles that prevent young people from responding to God's calling today? God is always calling. God is trying to reach to us, but sometimes in a world, people always have some type of reason. People always have some way to oh, make excuses for not wanting to respond. Perhaps you can share some of those things to uh, help us to identify with some of the things that you have experienced in your own life, as well what you have heard and what other people have experienced so that the young people know that yeah, they are not alone. There's nothing to be afraid of. It takes certainly courage, but sometimes we need to identify some of those obstacles that we may face in our life. 
Indeed, a very powerful question. And again, uh, Sister Aprilia, if it's okay with you, I'll share a few thoughts and invite you to chime in. Uh, one of the biggest challenges I find young people experiencing goes back to something we just talked about, that as much as we don't want to be in this time of pandemic, precisely because it's forcing us to slow down, to turn off some of the noise and let go of some of the busyness of our lives, it's an uncomfortable place to be. We live in a world where we're used to filling every waking moment and sometimes even our moments of trying to go to sleep with our earbuds and our phones and our devices. And we kind of want God maybe to communicate as conveniently as through a text or a WhatsApp message. It would be so clear, wouldn't it, if God would just tell us directly what he wants. But the listening we're talking about is not for a ringtone or a notification from our devices, but it's a, it's a still voice that happens inside. So we live in a busy world. We live in a noisy world. There's not a lot we can necessarily do about the world around us all the time, but let that not deter any of us from choosing how we limit or put boundaries around the use of these wonderful devices that are helping keep us all connected in, in fantastic ways. There need to be times where we can distance ourselves from them so that we don't prevent ourselves from listening in, to and hearing the voice of God. Another obstacle I find right now and, and hear this from so many young people uh, here in North America uh, who are thinking about a religious vocation is that our wider culture being as secularized as it is makes it very difficult at times for young people to feel a sense of confidence to step forward and say, I would like to serve as a priest, as a sister, as a brother, because it would not be the cool thing to do uh, we live in a kind of a me-focused society in many ways, not to mention the fact that we call a lot of our devices with the, the word I, right? I this and I that. There's a lot of focus on ourselves. And I think this idea of being able to have and discover the confidence to know that it's okay to walk that different path, a bit of a narrow path, it can be a lonely place at times. So we always try to encourage and introduce young people who are discerning to other young people who are discerning so that they will feel less alone. There's just not a lot of wider support in our culture today for a life of sacrifice, for a life of obedience, for a life of, of living simply. Another challenge that often comes about, more and more I see that the young person who approaches me to talk about discernment may be the only Catholic in their family or the only person in the family who was practicing their Catholic faith. And so sometimes parents have many other plans and dreams for their son or their daughter, and understandably so. And in many cultures, the parents would rightfully expect their children to work and provide for the, their needs as they age and the needs of their families. This is very understandable, but it creates a big, a big obstacle at times when young people feel that God is genuinely and sincerely calling them. They may not, not only lack the support of their family and encouragement, but I've even experienced some families that actually try to put obstacles in the way of young people who want to discern. And then finally, I'll say that one additional thing that I experience so often today is that many young people, in relation to something you said earlier, Father Doom, which I thought was very profound, many young people doubt and question, could God really call me? They fear something they've done, something they've failed to do, the type of person they have been somehow makes them unworthy of God's call. The newsflash I have for everyone, and I have to remind myself of this, is that of course we are unworthy. God is worthy to be praised, loved, and served. God is worthy to dedicate our entire existence to knowing that our existence in fact comes from God and God's worthiness will make up for and heal and make whole in me whatever is unworthy and whatever is lacking. The awareness of our unworthiness is actually a humble good awareness to know that we are always in the process of becoming more fully able to live in the image and likeness of God we were created. We will not always get it right but we're never so far off the path that God could not call us. Remember, as we said earlier, that Jesus washed even Judas' feet and Peter's feet. 
Peter, who denied Jesus, became the rock of the church. And so Peter had to find it within himself to be able to accept the forgiveness of Jesus so that he could be a new person and offer in response to what God was asking of him through Jesus to be the leader and the rock on which our church is established. Sister Aprilia, I, I thought you might have some things to, to add to that. Uh, I think it's only one, uh, maybe uh, the wording is different. It's uh, what I experience for, uh, with young people right now that, uh, you know, the lack of uh, commitment uh, afraid or they have fear that uh, life will be so difficult so they want to to have uh, things that it's it is easy you know which is for me uh, in everything you do or in every vocation you want to have you have to work on it there is nothing instant there is nothing uh, 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 easy and with so many choices here, uh, many are confused, you know, to choose, you know, which one, this one or that one or, or, or the other one. So tend to move around. So that's, that's one of the obstacles that I'm facing with young people right now. Thank you. One of the messages that I heard very clearly from both of you is that do not be afraid. Have courage to respond to God's calling you. Don't hide it. Don't run away from it. Take courage to respond to God. So what advice do you give to someone who has vocational interest? How do they discern or respond to God's will? What should a person do? What are the necessary steps to begin the journey to follow God's calling. What advice do you give to young people who has that vocational interest? Uh, okay, maybe I can share uh, advice, uh, some advice uh, to some people or to young people who are looking for or seeking their vocation. Actually, what I always ask to uh, my candidates are default your time for prayer, for your vocation. For example, pray Hail Mary every night uh, for your vocation. And also talk to the priest, the parish priest, or your teachers, or your parents, or someone you trust about, about your call or about what, what, is, uh, your, uh, what, what is your longing to become. And also uh, you can go for spiritual companions, uh, find someone who can talk and journey with you, uh, with your uh, spiritual journey. Uh, of course, that if you think that this is might be a lie for you, you can contact the vocation director or come for a discernment retreat. There are many discernment, discernment retreats uh, in this country. Uh, do the come and see, visit a convent, visit a seminary, and also uh, spend your time to do mission exposure with some religious orders. Uh, of course, that uh, in this era, you can easily find out information about religious life, about priesthood uh, through internet, Facebook, or Vision Magazine. Maybe uh, Father Adam can add more about this too. Absolutely, Sister Aprilia, I agree with all of those suggestions and would advise those to anyone listening. In addition, uh, just reflecting on my own journey uh, to, re to remind you how helpful I found it to read and study and learn about the faith. Uh, you have it easier than I did in those days now that you can Google everything. And so you have access to information at your fingertips. Get to know more about your faith by really reading, studying, and learning, in addition to talking pe to people who know the faith well. I would also highlight uh, Sister Aprilia's talking about uh, having some mission service. Uh, what I might interpret that to mean is that um, both of us spoke about opportunities to get involved in various volunteer experiences in your faith communities, to kind of try on, as it were, how it feels to be collaborating with, sharing your gifts with other people, being in front of people. 
um, kind of trying out that way of life. Uh, Sister Aprilia, thank you for reminding me to mention that uh, we have a wonderful service here in the United States for, uh, and even internationally, for people who are discerning their vocations. And this may blow your mind, but we actually have something called vocation match. It's kind of like eHarmony for people who are looking for the right fit of a religious community. The thing is, there are hundreds of different religious communities of men and women throughout the Catholic Church, so similar in their devotion to prayer, a communal life, some form of service, and a call to a simple life, a life of poverty, but each one distinct in the particular area of specialization or focus of how and what needs they serve within all the needs of God's people. And so this vocation match is something you can do online by going to vocationnetwork.org, vocationnetwork.org. You build a profile, you answer the survey questions, and then you will get the result, which will show you various religious communities which fit your profile. And then as Sister Aprilia mentioned, you will have the option of going to visit the website and social media of any or all of those communities. And it's within your control to decide if you would wish that your information be sent to any of those communities so that you can begin that conversation Sister spoke about with the vocation director. And finally, one last piece of advice I would give would be to be very clear on the fact that you don't necessarily figure everything out and make a decision that I will be a priest, I will be a sister, I will be a brother, and then you join a discernment program or talk with a vocation director. Discernment is something that happens over the course of time and it unfolds through various steps over the course of time. So the first step or commitment may be to look up some information. Another step may be to contact the vocation director of a community which interests you. Another step may be at the same time, getting involved in your parish, learning about your faith. So we have to be clear that discernment isn't one and done. It's not a one-time deal. And you don't stop discerning once you even enter a formation or training program. And this kind of merges into the question about what are the steps that one wants to pursue when one feels called. And so having taken all that advice, if one feels particularly drawn to potentially apply for the training and as we call formation program for a religious life, and Sister Aprilia can speak to how this will be slightly different for the sisters. In Divine Word, one first needs to get a college degree if they don't already have one. That can be done here at our college seminary in Iowa, or someone can pursue that college degree at another institution outside. After one finishes their college degree, which as we know is a several year commitment, they then go for a one year spiritual formation program called the novitiate. This is a non-academic year of training, which focuses primarily on developing the depths of one's spiritual life learning how to pray and to listen deeply to the call of God, the highlight of which is a 30-day retreat according to the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. When one finishes their novitiate after that year, they profess a temporary commitment to the community in the form of the three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. They then begin to live their temporary vows and resume or continue their training and their studies for brotherhood candidates. It could be a certificate in theological education followed by a master's degree in an area of interest to them that will be of service to God's people. And for those who are studying to be priests in the divine word community, they will do a four-year degree in theology, which will prepare them for ordination. And then one final step in our extensive program is that we require all of our candidates during temporary vows to go to another country and have a hands-on experience of learning the language and culture of the people and serving people. We call that the cross-cultural training program. So you see this process could last for many years and your discernment continues through that time. And even if you make a lifelong commitment to being a divine word missionary priest or a Holy Spirit missionary sister or a divine word brother, believe me, you will continue to discern how to live that out 
as time unfolds and different needs are presented to you and you have to make decisions about how to be the best, most faithful and effective missionary priest, brother or sister you feel called to be. Thank you, Father Adam McDonald. Certainly you have heard many advice already. Now the step that you need to take in order to respond. Uh, and the thing that we need to go back to right now, as we kind of already beginning to wrap up our program, our parishioner here at Our Lady of the Rosary Cathedral is always wanting to help, always want to support, and always want to encourage vocation to the priesthood, sisterhood, as well as brotherhood as well. How does the community here help in that effort to raise more awareness? Because you know that vocation is not only these three vocations to talk about, uh, talk about vocation to the marriage life, vocation of being a lay person, and a vocation in which God calling them to be who they truly are to be, the very image of God. So today, how can the parishioner here who are watching you, how can they help in this uh, promotion process? I would say the first and most important thing you can do before you program or plan anything is simply try yourself to be the best, most faithful and joyful witness of your own God-given vocation. If you can show that being a spouse to someone or the father or mother of someone is, is a joy for you, not to deny its challenges, but you really endeavor to do it with fidelity, integrity, and joy, I think that alone would be a tremendous witness. No pressure on you, Father Doom, but that also means that you and us priests and sisters and religious who have made that response need to try to be authentic and people of integrity. That that witness is just of such a tremendous value that cannot be uh, overstated. Uh, I would say that a great follow-up to a conversation like today would be for the parish to consider inviting a panel of people to speak at the parish, you know, when we can gather again, again uh, in groups. And if we need to do it virtually for now, that would work too. But to be able to bring together people who live those various vocations. And thank you so much for reminding us we would really want to hear from and would welcome the voices of our married brothers and sisters and our single brothers and sisters, but to hear from a variety of voices about their experiences. This would allow young people in the parish to see that real people like you and me are making these decisions and calls each day. I think making sure that the parish uh, not only provides uh, this type of opportunity, but that there is information available in the parish maybe printed in the bulletin or somewhere in the vestibule or gathering space where uh, communi communities can post say posters or informational brochures. Uh, maybe the diocese has its promotional materials as well. Uh, these would all be very important things to do. And then perhaps to consider what would it look like for the parish to consider maybe a couple of times a year to inviting young people who may feel called to come together for uh, a pizza supper and then to have a priest and a sister there uh, that, could, that could meet with them and share stories. But it would be in kind of a, a relaxed environment. There's obviously food involved, which makes it fun. But also then so that young people can meet other young people who may feel called and not feel as alone or think that it's not cool because they're the only one who's thinking this way. So uh, maybe looking for some opportunity to, to actually invite young people who feel they might have an interest uh, to come together and learn more. Uh, maybe for me, uh, just uh, to add that, please pray for vocation, please pray for us and please uh, uh, spread the, the, the prayer life to your uh, children uh, to the, in the parish and, and at the same time, we will also pray for all of you. Thank you very much for helping our, thank you very much for helping our parishioner to be involved in this process as well. Because vocation is a gift and that gift is freely given to us. And we now have to learn how to share that gift with other people. Now, before I say goodbye to both of you, 
Uh, do you have any last thing that you would like to say or add to the program that can help this program uh, maybe more prayerful or more exciting? I think you've done a wonderful job, Father Duong, of making this a very prayerful, exciting experience. I know I was very excited, uh, as was Sister Aprilia, when you reached out to us to invite us. The only thing I'd like to add is just consistent with what I said a few minutes ago. I truly do believe that with each passing day and year, I enjoy and love my vocation more than I ever have before. I did not know that was going to be the case as a younger religious and priest. I kind of thought it would become very routine and very normal. But there is a grace that comes with just opening my eyes to each new day and asking God to make use of me this day for God's glory and the service of my brothers and sisters. And it is an unending adventure. So it is possible to commit yourself to this way of life and to grow ever more deeply in love with it. And that's something I really want to leave with our listeners. Listeners, It's just how much I really do love and feel humbled by and grateful for God's call in my life. I like to say that the best thing God ever did for me was to call me to be a divine word missionary priest. The best thing I ever did was say yes. Uh, for me, uh, I, can, I can testify that the greatest things, the greatest gift is to be a missionary and like Father Adam also, I did not imagine that my life will be like this. This is priceless and it has been a great journey, a great life. And after all these years, I realized that my life has been a gift, a grace and a blessing from God. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, thank you for saying yes to God and responding to God's calling. So right now, as we conclude our program, I would like to take this moment to give thanks to Father Adam McDonald and Sister Aprilia for being present with us, sharing with us your story, answering some of the questions about vocation, especially to help young men and women to respond to their personal call from God, because we would like them to say yes to God. We would like them to respond and to live a life that is fully alive, because your life is an example so are many other people who have responded to God. So today, before we say our concluding prayer, uh, we have just a little bit of a couple of slides to give some information uh, about uh, the Divine Word Missionary. If you would like to ask question, talk to a vocational director about your life and a religious vocation, receive further information in the mail, or inquire about possible speaker of an event, please contact Father uh, Adam McDowell, a, a vocational director. And you have all the website, the address, and also the number down below. The thing is that you might not be able to remember it, okay? So go back at the end of this program and go to the place if you need to contact that information. I also have another information as well uh, for sister. So Sister Abrilia Untaro, an SSPS sister, she's also a vocational director. She's with the Holy Spirit Missionary Sister. So all her information is down below as well, from email, Facebook, website, phone number, address, all those information are vital. There are many ways that we can contact, but it's only need one first step. When you say yes, take that first step to respond to any of those contact information so that we can help you to journey in your vocational choice. Thank you very much for being here with us today, uh, Father Adam, and thank you very much, Sister Aprilia, for being present. It is a blessing for me to have you come and say yes to my invitation. And uh, our community at Our Lady of the Rosary Cathedral is very blessed to have you here sharing with us. So right now we will be concluding our program with a prayer. And I invite the community as well to both of you to join me in saying the prayer together. You know that May is a month of Mary. Now I ask Mary, this is a prayer to Mary for vocation. So our Pope invite all of us during this month to pray the rosary. So we have to be near to our mother asking Mary to intercede for us and to help us in this uh, in our life, especially to responding to God. Is God calling you? How do I respond? I hope that you're following the example of Mary so that you can say yes to God as Mary did to God. 
So let us now uh, finish with this prayer of vocation with Mary. O oh, Virgin Mary, Mother of God and Mother of the Church, to you we commend our young people, in particular those called to closely follow your son. You know, O oh, oh Mary, the struggles, struggles, the struggles, the so obstacles, the obstacles. They face. Assist them to answer yes to the divine call as you did at the invitation of the angel. Draw them near to your heart so that they can understand the joy that awaits them when the Lord Jesus calls them to be witnesses of his love in the world. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you everyone for being here today. I hope that you have enjoyed our program and you have a wonderful day. Thank you, uh, Sister uh, Aprilia and thank you, Father Adam McDonald. Thank you so much. Thank Father. you. Thank yeah. you. Bye. God bless. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, you too.